We were living a perfectly normal life until my son developed an, a lump in his neck, and I took him to the doctor. He was 13, and I took him on Friday, and when he went in, he had a pea-sized lump. Uh, and the doctor said he didn't like it, he wanted to biopsy it. And he set up a, he scheduled it for the following Monday. By Monday, it was the size of a golf ball. And they removed it. And that night he called me and he said, Carmen, it doesn't look good. And he was crying. And um, he um, told me it was non-Hodgkin's at first, which meant he would be dead in six months. We lived in New York at the time. And my mom was having to transport my brother back and forth to his chemo and we kind of had a live-in babysitter while my mom and my dad were taking him to the hospital and getting his treatments and stuff. I remember my brother was really sick. You know, at the time, I didn't have an inkling of how sick he really was. We were having to drive 306 miles round trip a day. He was very nauseated after the treatments, and then the traveling made it worse. And he wasn't eating regularly, so he was dropping weight extremely quick. And I was afraid that the trip and the treatments were going to kill him before the cancer had a chance to. You know, they were just a blue-collar family trying to make it. And it was pretty expensive from what we remember. And I just needed to get closer to where he could have his treatments. So I discussed it with my husband, and we decided to rent a place in Connecticut closer to the hospital where he was being treated. And in doing so, I was having trouble finding a place that would rent to four children. I had passed an old colonial with a for rent sign. Well, I stopped and I went upstairs and looked around and it was a very nice house. I was impressed. I didn't think there was any way I could afford it. And I contacted the landlord and it was affordable. He agreed to rent to me and I was ecstatic. And we went home and got prepared to move. When I first came in the house, my brother was showing me some of the weird things like the, the room where they made the headstones and the footstones and the body lifts, and that's kind of how we were putting things together, that it was a funeral home. When we first discovered it was a funeral home, I went to the landlord and I discussed it with him. We would have lost the money we put down for a deposit in the first month's rent had we have backed out. The house across the street used to be Hallahan Funeral Home. It was Hallahan Funeral Home when we moved in, and has been since the 30s, maybe earlier. The Hallahan family owned the house um, as long as I could remember. Um, they had the funeral home. They lived upstairs. Uh, very, very nice people. Well, I worked in all the funeral homes in Southington at some point in time. I'd get a call to go in and do a corpses here and make up. He needed help occasionally to uh, go retrieve bodies from the hospital morgue and uh, he came over once in a while when I was around and he asked if I could take a ride with him in the hearse to go pick a body up in the morgue. When you walked to the bottom of the stairs there was a big open room and it had a counter that went completely around the room. That was the south coffin room, that was my bedroom. And the north coffin room it had big metal pipes sticking out of the wall and that's where the coffins were placed and those were the more I guess expensive coffins and they were on display for people to purchase. There was a storage room off to the left you walk in that room a little bit past the furnace and there was a blood pit in the right corner that went down and that's where back in the day when they embalmed people they would have on a table above it and the blood would drain down into the pit. There was a bigger room and that's where the coffin lift was that actually they lifted after they put the bodies in the coffins they lifted them up through the floor to the display area. When we started to move in I went there with Matt one time just to let him pick his bedroom. The kitchen had a really nice cobblestone tile floor and I went to put the mop to the floor and the water turned this deep red and it was thick and it had a putrid smell. And there was a, a carpenter woman still in the house doing some crown molding. And I went and got her and I said, uh, look at the floor, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And she kind of squatted down and looked at it and left and never returned. My um, family had kind of, my parents were going through a divorce and just Aunt Carmen was always through the years kind of like a second mom and she knew that we were going through hard times and she just called and it was set up that fast, you know, just come up and stay, we've got room, great. The house was, um, all in itself was scary looking at it, very scary feeling when you walked in. 
they were living there full time and my dad was commuting on the weekends. He would come in Friday night and stay until Sunday night and then he'd leave Sunday to go back be back at work Monday morning. Me and Matt were very close. He took me downstairs into the mortuary and we kind of hung out on the gurneys down there. There was a there was a separation from upstairs to downstairs. The basement always had its own feel, its own uh, emotion. Immediately, Matt heard his name being called from the basement the very first day in there. And he told me that. And I was concerned, knowing what was going on to his head and neck, that the medication, the treatments, were causing him some um, mental issues. When we first moved in the house, it was pretty much the same way it was when we lived in New York. Me and my brother got along great. You know, the family got along great. And uh, me and my brother started telling my parents stuff that was happening in the house. And my parents didn't believe us. And my dad would get mad at my older brother, saying that he was putting stuff into our heads. And my brother started to get a little bit more withdrawn as we lived there longer, because he was seeing more, and it was affecting him a lot more than it was affecting me. He had a journal or a notebook that he would write poems and letters and notes and just he would jot anything down and a lot of it was really dark and enough to make me go to my Aunt Carm in regards and worry. Within weeks of being there I was already pretty upset and worried that Matt was not doing well. But you know, as a mother you expect your teenager to start going through that stuff about that time and I knew that him having to face his own mortality at a very young age could cause him to want to live fast, thinking that he wasn't going to live another year. But his personality continued to take a darker side. He had gotten pretty mean and just started attacking Brad constantly. Just leave me alone! It's okay. I remember having to break them up in fights, which would cause fights between me and Matt. He was going to a priest once a week and a psychiatrist once a week, trying to help him through those issues. And I was hoping that it would just be something we'd come out the other end of, just like the cancer treatments. There were a lot of things that I saw down in the basement. There were entities that would appear. Me and my older brother were showing her different parts of the uh, downstairs storage area, and we were going to take her into where the coffin headstones were made. And uh, you look down, and there was this gentleman in a long gray jacket, and he was completely gray. And when he turned to look at us, he had no eyes. They were just like black, dry sockets. And he took a couple steps to us and then just disappeared. We called them black apparitions um, in the corner on the ceilings, constantly um, moving lights. There was orbs we'd seen in the house that would float, float around the house, and they were gray in matter, and they were about this big and they were completely see-through it just looked like a wisp of air or maybe cigarette smoke but it was perfectly cylindrical and it would fly around the room and it would disappear it'd go straight to a wall or go straight to the top of the ceiling um you could see something that twickered like a, a lightning bug and then it's a full person standing in front of you seconds later it was also a little shadow figure who used to hide in one of the corners and he'd play games he'd stick his head out and you'd kind of see him and you'd disappear but it wasn't like a shadow like a person shadow. It was a shadow where you could see that it looked like a person, but you could see through them. The ghost stories continued to escalate. And first it was one, then it was two, and then it was all the kids. And they would see things like um, a woman in the room. Then there was the little boy, a little black boy about six in the Superman pajama. He used to come out um, in the South Coffin room, and he'd come out of the left wall and fly around the countertop. He was always in his pajamas and he seemed lost. The younger kids um, spoke of him sitting there and playing with toys or he would take a stuffed animal and tell them he was gonna bring it back and he would bring the stuffed animal back and it, if it were a bunny rabbit, it would be missing its carrot or he would always keep a little piece of something that he, any toy he took, he would keep. I didn't believe in, in ghosts. I didn't believe, I believed in God and I believed in the devil. But I believed that the devil was someone that put bad thoughts in your mind. I didn't know he could reach out and slap me. There was another night when me and my brother were awoke in the house, and I had one of those little mole control robots, and there was three guys standing over by our dresser in long black trench coats, and uh, they were messing with the robot. And my brother said something, and the robot just went flying across the room and hit the wall and broke.
and they were gone. So me and my brother started screaming, and my dad came down with the shotgun. I saw a broken robot and a few toys that were smashed. And he believed us on that point because the robot was actually laying on the floor broken. So he couldn't say it didn't really happen. We used to leave the bedroom lights on downstairs in the basement, and of course that caused the electric bill to go through the roof. When my husband saw the electric bill, and everyone was sleeping with the lights on. He just removed the lights out of the basement where the boys were sleeping. Well, after he pulled the bulbs out, one night I was laying in bed and my sister came down the stairs. And she started flicking on the light switch downstairs. And I said, sis, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be down here. And I got up and I chased her up the stairs. And I chased her into the living room. And my dad and mom were sitting there, and they said, what are you doing out of bed? You need to go downstairs and go to bed. And I said, well, where's my sister at? She just was downstairs turning the lights on and off. And they said, no, she's in bed. Go look and see for yourself. And I walked in there, and I looked, and my sister was sleeping. And I was walking by my dad, and he said, well, quit messing around, because you know I took those bulbs out anyways. There were crucifixes on both sides of the door jamb that had been there for many, many years. They were discolored, and you could tell that they'd been there for many years. They started disappearing one at a time. Most of the activity stayed in the morgue until those crucifixes disappeared. And as they disappeared, as they... That. Scared the crap out of me. <laughs> How can that possibly have just happened like that? Are you okay, Carmen? I'm fine. Did it hit you? No, it just scared the crap out of me. Something is really cold in this room. I want to get out of this room right now. Okay. We're giving recognition. This kind of thing happens. The best thing to do is get through it as quickly as possible. Okay. And then um, everything will go back to normal. My husband uh, didn't believe it. He thought it was uh, mace mainly Matt's fault that he thought that he was inciting the stories. Before my parents believe, believed the stuff that was going on in the house, we tried everything we could to make them believe that what we were saying was true. There was just no tangible evidence. We couldn't take a picture because we didn't have cameras. You know, we tried recording them on, on little kids' record, recordable things, and people would say it's just static. No, I didn't think there was anything wrong with the home. I thought something was wrong with Matt, and I put him in a mental hospital. And that was when uh, another hurdle that was very tough. They came with an ambulance and took him away. And then when we got there to the hospital, they put him in a cot that was basically a straitjacket in this, a room the size of a closet. And they were gonna shut the door and they wouldn't let me speak to him or be near him. And they said, you have to leave. And he's screaming, mom, don't leave me, mom, don't leave me. And the last thing he said is now they're gonna come after you. Shortly after I had Matt put in the hospital, is when things escalated. There was a man that used to appear in my room after my older brother moved out. And he was one of the mo more scarier things that I've seen. He was just a head, he had long hair, but he had a wicked scar that came down the center of his face. And this whole side of his face was smooth, like, kind of like metal. And he just had a circle for an eye. It didn't have any color, any pupil or anything. And he would just start flying around the room. I went to the refrigerator, hungry, just searching for something to nibble on. 20 minutes before, it was fine. I went back, and it was just rotted and corroded. How does an apple go from being something I just bit out of to being rotted and nasty? I would have never picked that up to eat it because it would have just bled out in my hand. Um, one night, my niece Tammy came into the room and she said, Aunt Carmen, it's happening again. The curtains flew up, and as I pushed her back, I could see the perfect imprint of a hand underneath her shirt. All three knuckles, the, the bone from the wrist, the outlines of the fingernails. It was like a thousand hands just in wind and just voices and just horrible noises. And I called the church, and they said, say the rosary and call me in the morning. And we commit to doing that and I'm wearing the rosary as a necklace as I did constantly, all day, every night. And it engulfed us, this black cloud is what I call it. And the rosary beads just lifted up. It lifted, levitated off her chest and shattered. So I ran into the bedroom and jumped on the bed and I told my husband that the house was haunted. 
We did start sleeping on mattresses and air mattresses in the living room as a community so we could have, you know, white light on us because when there was a white light present, it did mess with us and we felt safe for sleeping in groups. Which was kind of cool because it felt like we were all camping out <laughs> and we were all together so it, I wasn't as scared. There were a lot of times that <clears throat> the presence would be so strong you could feel it. You could be running away from it and it would be in your face the whole time just that close. You could smell it, feel it, know it was there, it let you know it was there. It was almost like we were ambushed is the best way I can describe that to you. The main one that I really remember was um, Aunt Carmen was in the shower. It was like something was alive in the shower curtain. It was wrapped around her like it was trying to suffocate her. Like I had to fight to get the curtain pulled away from her. And she on the inside screaming and panicking, trying to fight too. It actually happened to my husband as well. It liked to attack you when you were alone. And the bathroom was the perfect spot for that because that was the one place that you always went alone. Carmen would go under a lot of attack. She would get dragged into this very dark, deep place. She would just hit the floor just pass out. And she couldn't move, she couldn't talk, there was no reactions whatsoever, so I knew she was into something very deep. There was only darkness, there was no light, and each time it was a little different. It was like something was trying to take her over or control her or hurt her. And I, I ran into different beings. We would be over her with Bibles and rosaries, crying and praying, her hands would be ice cold. And the next thing I would know, I'd be back in my body and things would be, I'd be on the floor and there'd be people around me saying prayers and I'd be wet from holy water. Finally tonight, chapter two of what some are calling a real ghost story. You may recall our telling you about what some call a haunted house in Southington. Well, something's afoot there again and Elizabeth McGuire brings us the latest. I'm still afraid of this house. Well-known ghost hunters Ed and Lorraine Warren were called in after family members claimed they heard mysterious voices and saw apparitions. The house is a former funeral home. Pulleys that used to lift coffins are still in place. A table once used to prep bodies now holds laundry. Each night for weeks, Carmen has laid out mattresses in the living room. The family and the investigator sleeping together for safety and to keep a close watch on what may exist in this house. The Warrens encouraged us to go public. Um, basically, they said that it would get the church in quicker. But my husband was really getting tired of all the people being in the house. He was coming home from work tired, and there's uh, six people in the house. And he said, well, if this will get it over faster, fine, go public. And that's what happened. And um, I don't think that he understood the ramifications. I know I didn't of what going public would do to our children. When the story first came out, we had to go public. Um, it was kind of embarrassing, and I was pretty angry at my Aunt Carm, hoping there would be other ways because I was in high school. Things turned really bad. People that I hung out with, you know, all my friends stopped hanging around me. There was a couple kids who actually picked fights with me, and I wound up fighting a couple times because, you know, they were saying that I was crazy, my parents were crazy, and crazy parents cause crazy kids. It came to that point where we knew the church was going to sanction the exorcism in that house. Now, this has been shrouded with so much doubt. People have said, there was no exorcism that was performed in there. I was involved with it. I was involved with the evaluations. I was involved with several of the clergy members. I can't give you the names, and I was actually uh, had to sign a release saying that I would never divulge the actual ritual. There were three priests and three deacons. There was a strong man and a secretary to take notes. I wasn't allowed in the house. I was too young. It was too dangerous for me to be in the house or around the house when it happened, so I stayed away with a friend. They had brought in some religious relics, one of which was a Madonna, and they were placed in various places throughout the house. They spoke the Mass in Latin, in Hebrew, and in English. During the exorcism, there were several different things that actually had transpired in there. We had rumbling that went through the house. All the time, it was cold, it was nasty, and it was dark in that house. Ed and Lorraine Warren was there. Mr. Warren got some chest pains. I was very concerned for his well-being. And at the climax, it was like it just broke. The second we said amen, it was like spring showed up in the house. And that home was successfully exercised. 
After the exorcism was performed, we waited six days to make sure everything was clear, and we moved out. When we moved down to where we live now, nobody knew us, and it wasn't really talked about. My brother, luckily, um, thank God, he did pull through his, his cancer. Um, he's got beautiful children. He's got a, a wife. He's, he travels. He sees the world.